Good morning, all. Be polite and introduce myself. I'm Keith Russell, um, uh, engagements manager at the ARDC. I'm just uh, here to um, answer any questions uh, if you have any. joined ARDC here um, and we're going to take this opportunity to hand it all the way over to Ian um, to, to welcome you properly. Thank you. Thanks Liz. Um, hi my name's Ian Duncan, I'm the Acting Director of the ARDC. Um, I'd like to thank you all for adopting the usual lecture, uh, lecture position of all standing up for the back. Uh, we decided we, at the end we're going to have everyone at the back summarise through interpretive dance. Up at the front. Um, all right, so today um, we have what we're trying to do today is both give you some information and get some information from you. And so the information we'd like to provide is where we're at in terms of what the ARDC is, what we're going to be doing, where we're going to be going, and we want to test those ideas with this group. We're, this is the first meeting of six going around the states. Uh, so we have Canberra tomorrow, and we have Melbourne, Hobart next week, and Adelaide and Perth the week after. So please, we, we really want a lot of feedback um, and as much information from you as possible. So what we'll do uh, for this first session, um, and I do appreciate that you kind of blocked out big chunks of your day to do this, is uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the background so that everybody at least has a shared understanding of where we're from and, and what, uh, you know, what the history is. Uh, we'll be talking about some of our partners, um, but not all of them, and just outlining those. And a lot of this is foundation setting just to make sure everybody knows and everyone's on the same uh, level in terms of what we're talking about. And, oops, did that just change? Um, and then we'll talk about our strategy, or at least the, where the strategy is at the moment. Now, our strategy activity, you can imagine three organisations would have their own strategies. Bringing two organisations is quite difficult. Uh, together is quite difficult. Bringing three together is really very difficult. Uh, and Michelle Bark, our Deputy Director, is just down here, is leading the strategy uh, activity and uh, looks much more tired now than she did when that started. Uh, that's a big piece of work. And, and so we really would like your feedback on whether you think we're, we're taking an appropriate uh, direction there. We'll have a little bit of time for discussion at the end. Um, I am conscious of the fact that because I've been looking at these things so much, a lot of it seems completely obvious to me. And so and that's a good opportunity to say that what did you mean by this or what we're talking about when uh, you outlined that. Uh, and then we'll have some questions for you to ponder. And we'll also have a poll. So if you wanted to get ready uh, for that poll, this is the, uh, the bureau up at the top, um, that'll get you to the right page. Um, Keith will be running that poll at the end of the session. And it's only, it's got a couple of questions, but I think they're ones that will be very helpful uh, for us, which I think will become much more obvious as we go along. Okay, so a little bit of the background. Uh, we're part of ENCRIS. Uh, I assume, does everybody, hands up who doesn't know what Ingress is? No one. Awesome. I can skip straight over that slide. So Ingress was a massive uh, federal government investment and has been uh, reinvested in over the last few years. And this year there was a significant investment in the capital side. So Ingress had, it was on a sort of holding pattern with annual funding uh, and now we have opportunity to move forward on the capital side as well. Now that capital funding was not evenly spread over all of the increased capabilities. Uh, so some increased capabilities got quite significant capital funding and some less. Some had roadmaps for how they could describe uh, their investment cases in the next round. And we'll touch on that in a little bit, uh, in a couple of slides along. So, ANS, Nectar and RDS. Does everybody here know who ANS, Nectar and RDS were? So we were three of the e-research uh, Projects, you know, loosely describe the research capabilities within NCRIS. Uh, the two other, I guess, really significant um, big ones are the HPC capabilities, uh, the National Computational Infrastructure in Canberra, and the Pawsey HPC Centre in uh, Perth. Now, over the last few years, um, 
there's been a lot of talk about the, the separation of those, those capabilities. So ANS was uh, a lot about the quality of data, curation of data, skills and workforce development, policy work with the government to describe frameworks that facilitated high quality outputs. Uh, and so they had a particular set of people they engaged with and a, and a type of activity that uh, was um, going to get carried out there. Nectar was uh, so initiated the Nectar Research Cloud, which was the uh, federated open stack cloud, and really was quite revolutionary at the time, uh, particularly trying to do something like that on a national scale. Also the virtual lab program, <clears throat> which is generally regarded as being one of the jewels in the crown, right? One of the real achievements of um, our capabilities has been the virtual labs and how they've changed that paradigm of, you know, bench top linking together of bits of software and data and making that a little bit more industrial and higher quality. And IDS had a very straightforward kind of mandate, which was data is an asset, data is an infrastructure asset. And how can we make sure that Australia curates and manages and maintains those assets as effectively as possible over time? So bringing all those pieces together makes a lot of sense, right? So you've got the data asset, you've got the, the Nectar Cloud and the virtual labs which can act on those data assets, and then you have the quality, curation, stewardship, and the, and the long-term reuse of data on an initiative of hands. So in 2017, uh, we were still three separate projects. So I was the director of IDS, uh, and my colleagues Ross uh, Wilkinson and Glenn Maloney, the directors of Hands and Nectar, we were asked to align those activities as much as possible. Right. So we uh, came up with with words to describe the common ground between the different programs. That was not easy to do, and some of you will have experienced uh, the kind of spin-off of the of the difficulty in coming to some shared language and shared kind of initiatives there. Following that, I mean, that was pretty uh, successful. We had the Data and Arts Virtual Lab program as well as the research. Finishing up very shortly. This year, we've been integrated into one virtual identity. So technically, we're still three separate projects with three separate uh, contracting agents. We now have one governance body. So we have one board, which is made up of uh, members of the old boards, but we're one, we are acting as one organisation, that's the Australian Research Data Commons. In 2019, the intention is to actually become a single legal entity. So there'll be one contracting body for the government. And that's quite a, that's a significant shift in terms of how we relate to institutions, uh, how we interact. So all of the AIDC staff, I think, are employed through uh, institutions, uh, and many institutions, I think it's nine or some universities and those stuff. And how do we maintain that ability to be closely linked to the uh, universities while perhaps having a separate legal entity? So some work around defining whether a separate company is the right idea or going to one lead agent or some other kind of model, that's happening at the moment. Um, but we certainly see increase 24 projects. There are plenty of different uh, corporate models there, and we're trying to learn as much as we can from those. What do we do? We do quite a lot of different things. So, across all of the different capabilities, this is I won't read through the list, but you can see some are technical services, some are software services, skills and workforce development, some are little influences, uh, sort of policy work we do with the government. Uh, some are general uplift pieces, so coordinating uh, community development and uh, training activities across different groups. And then we have the kind of some of the bigger, heavier pieces around uh, infrastructure heavy parts, so particularly on the RDS and Nectar sites. So the bit that people are actually really interested in, two bits. How much money and where's the money going to go? And when is that going to happen? So this slide, this is the money we have um, for the next five years or so. We have about $110 million in operational funding and about $70 million in capital funding. So that's a significant amount of funding. And one of the reasons we've uh, not acted as quickly as some people would have liked, particularly around the capital side, is we were given very clear instructions to spend this money carefully. 
it took a lot of time and efforts to get that capital allocation. And those two words are the pieces. Be careful, just make sure that you're spending the money uh, in a way that the community wants and can sustain, but spend the money. Don't hold on to the money, right? So we do want to get these activities happening as soon as we can. And where I say internal and external investments, one of the questions which we're trying to address is how much of the activity is uh, activity which we would do as an ARDC internal thing? So, uh, and how much of it is uh, stuff we would do through partners? Currently we do uh, the bulk of activity, uh, yeah, probably the bulk of activity through our partnership model. And that I think we still see as being an extremely powerful uh, model going forward. Now, the, we've been reviewed to death. There have been that many reviews of the e research capabilities, some around data, some around structural pieces, some around uh, activity and interaction with the uh, commercial sector. Um, and so these are some of the pieces of advice that we've had. So this is not coming to you again necessarily with a clean sheet of paper and saying, what can we do for you? Because I think we've done that maybe every year for the last three or four years. This is saying we've got some ideas about how we think we'd like to go based on those discussions earlier and these review pieces of work. Can you just let us know whether you think we're getting uh, going in the right direction? Now, all of those uh, reviews, were there consistencies across them? Yes, they were. Deliver an integrated data in intensive infrastructure. So that's uh, one of our jobs is to work towards uh, a an environment which has integration across the physical infrastructure, policies, data, software, tools, and support. doesn't mean we necessarily have to provide all of those things. It means we should facilitate and encourage and capitalise that activity as much as we can. Promote national coherence. So again, how do we make it easier for researchers to go from the desktop to the cloud high performance, how can we make it easier for data to move between those pieces, how can we make it easier for uh, trust in that data to be established and maintained. And why would we do that? So this was one of the pieces of work from last year in trying to develop some shared aims and shared language. So what's the impact, what's the actual output we're after? Now we live in a part of the research life cycle that's quite early, you know, low down in the system. We're not the ones who publish papers, we don't develop better roundabouts, but we do provide the tools and resources which should help people do those things. So impact for us is, is perhaps, we have a view of where our impact model, where that line starts and stops. But the, we have these four transformations which are kind of the underpinning piece that we're trying to work towards. One, deliver a world leading data advantage. Uh, we can talk about what that means a little bit later. Accelerate innovation to make it easier for uh, the research community and our partners to innovate over resources and facilities, uh, to improve collaboration for borderless research. And by borderless, we don't mean necessarily international, we mean interstate, within an institution, across different institutions. What we're saying is how can we remove the friction uh, for sharing in whatever form that is, and how do we facilitate translation so again, translation is one of those things which is a real challenge. We can't generate the translation. Perhaps what we can do is create a framework and environment which makes it easier for translation to occur. With the aim of making Australia's research sector as competitive. Feel free to interrupt at any point. Now, I'm just going to, uh, the next slide talks about FAIR, so I'm just going to quickly go through FAIR. Uh, everybody familiar with the FAIR uh, concepts? Findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, used to describe data generally and uh, increasingly around uh, software and the uh, broader spectrum of pieces. We've taken quite a broad interpretation of FAIR. We've said, well, if you can have findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data, perhaps you can apply that idea to the other pieces we care about as well. So we've taken those four transformations, and we've tried to break them down into pieces that are a little bit more um, action. So what, what are some intermediate targets we can aim for and we can describe that can create a framework within which people can generate activity? So we've said, well, let's make, make this uh, data more fair. 
to make the infrastructures more fair, uh, the research platforms. And uh, the last one, which is actually critical when it's the working system, is to get almost everybody around skills and workforce development. So, how do we make sure that people are able to use the tools and are aware of those tools and have uh, you know, an awareness of best practice and have actually built into their workflows? And who would we do that with? If you've read the Ingress roadmap, it talks about the digital data and the research platforms, elegant acronym of EDER, um, and that's us, so AIDC, uh, the Australian Access Federation, INEX, and NCI. So that we've actually been identified as a group, as a sort of e research uh, the e-research organisations that we already work with, so there's a lot of e-research uh, nodes and groups around the country that Nectar and RDS are particularly work tightly with. Institutions, we want to increasingly align what we're doing with what the institutions themselves are doing. So we do a lot of work through those e-research organisations, but we've done a lot of that to be directed or coordinated with what the institutions are doing. And commercial resources. So how if, how can we inject that commercial sort of hybrid model where it's appropriate? So if we're looking at that as well. And in terms of um, is that it? No. So we're really open to partnerships and activity. Anyone can add to that to these activities. So I, won't, I can't go through all of the partners, but what I will do is just briefly go over some of the, I guess, the really heavy hitting ones that we're at, where our focus will be on initially, right? So the first one is we're part of the English network. And so a major priority for us is to align our activity with our colleagues within English. So when we do engage in activities, we will look at whether there is an English capability that's aligned with that priority, whether we can work through them. So the English capabilities often act as aggregators for communities or technologies or particular drivers. And uh, Michelle and probably uh, Andrew Trador are going to speak to all the increased capabilities to define a similar discussion to the one we're having now, saying what are your priorities? And this is where we think we're going, how do those pieces align? We'll bring together that increased conversation, stakeholders for the available conversation. Going to have a, yeah, a, a cut of that that won't be the final document. Uh, it'll have some, we hope it'll have identified some of the really big priorities for people. Uh, and then we have our DDIR problem. So there's Pausy, NCI, Arnet, everyone will know Arnet, and I know most of you will be aware that Arnet is moving. Uh, they're expanding their capability set from from earlier. Network provider to providing some of the more value added services, particularly around storage. So, cloud storage is a huge part of products um, already, and so we're talking about how we solve it. It's very expensive, and not just us, I should say, it's a very expensive piece of technology. And uh, the Australian Access Federation, so, presumably, you all know who the AAF are, they provide you the national researcher identity. We've done some work with them around how can we facilitate uh, access for the non-research sector into some of these tools and services. So part of that translation drive and positioning those resources to be able to be accessible from outside the sector obviously involves around access and innovations and then pay up is key to that. All right, now we get to the meaty thing. What is our strategy? Yeah. Just repeat that question as far as I remember. So, the high secondary day IDC, we're quite low down in the research stats, most of them in resources and some of the results. Um, and Andrew's comment was from an institutional perspective, we're perhaps a little bit higher up in the institutions want to understand how they can exploit the bits we provide to deliver their outcomes for research. Yeah, well, okay, so yes, we provide resources and our intention is to shape that program 
around an alignment with the institutions. The institutions understand very closely what the research priorities are. Um, I guess what I was meaning by we're low down in the research stack is we don't publish papers. We, it's difficult for us to get the you know, acknowledgements in uh, various bits of pieces. But we can encourage people to uh, well, make sure that acknowledgements are made across that system. We can link the pieces together. So we're not at the front end of research. If we have an impact on people having impact. Uh, and I guess the same could be said sort of from an institutional perspective. The institutions run like the other side. We're, we're slant and the the underpinning of the pieces, I guess the bit in the background that enables the outputs. So, Alright, so we've done some work with CSIRO around their uh, impact framework and that I would be hard to recommend anybody go on that course. That was all over and really very useful for us. So that's uh, just, you know, you get so busy that you're just busy stuff you need to do because you need to do it. The CSIRO impact framework is a really useful way of saying, okay, what's the end game? Why are you doing any of this? And essentially, if you're going to boil it all down, um, as Tom Facilito said, every step is a support. Why are you doing this stuff? What's the point of that? And working from the end, so they have the triple bottom line as their kind of framework for impact. Uh, for us, we don't actually come out that end so much, right? We have impact on people who are producing economic, societal or environmental benefits. So how do we describe our impact model? So we've kind of bastardised their model a tiny bit and drawn a little bit of a line around it. Um, and we're saying, well, let's look at where we live and the pieces we can do. Uh, and the transformations, I guess, are currently Okay, a description of our impact. Uh, now, in the CSIRO uh, model, it's really very interesting that a lot of the things we assume are impact actually are outcomes. They're you know, better tools for this or, or uh, an improved community for collaboration across different domains. And you go, well, okay, that's an impact we've had. But actually, that's not the real impact. Why is that useful for the world that you've done that? Um, for us, so we've described some of those in the outcome section there, and this uh, this is very much a work in progress. So words may shift between all of these different pieces as we go along, but I guess in very broad terms, these are the pieces we're looking at. And, and what will be of great interest to some of the people in this room are the first two, the resources and the activities, which are where we have invested significant amounts over the last few years, and we certainly intend to invest significant amounts going forward. But resources, hardware infrastructure, we're not necessarily saying, what we're saying is that resource needs to exist. We believe it needs to exist. We have two people doing some work around the hardware side of things and around the platform side of things, the virtual labs uh, and the uh, collections and, and, those, and the metrics is really difficult. Uh, we believe those resources probably will need to exist and those activities will need to go on. We don't know how we should necessarily do that. So we're certainly not starting off with an assumption that we would just continue resourcing and yeah, funding that in the same way we have previously. That may well be the appropriate way that comes out of this exercise, but we're going to take a really good, you know, take a step back and examine all those pieces and make sure that that's valid. Now, the reason for the cloudy bits at the bottom is that we have a pretty flexible view on what's capital and what's operational expense, right? We can operationalize a machine and we could also capitalize the person. So uh, it's not so useful for people engaging with us to say this is going to be a capital exercise or it's going to be an operational exercise. More important is to say this is a value exercise. This is, this is the impact we're looking for. And we'll describe uh, in, a, in the following slides how we are going to look at uh, setting those, you know, those stakes in the ground so people know how they can come and approach us. So, but well, we do have those two big chunks of money. Think less about them as chunks of money and more about them as being a significant resource people can exploit. 
if we can describe it in a way that fits in this impact model. Um, so this is a slightly busy slide. I just wanted to go back and say a recap of we have these transformations. We've broken that down a little bit into the into the themes and saying these are slightly more actionable pieces. And from that, we said, well, that's nice. We've got actionable pieces. How, how are we going to evaluate and describe how people can approach us to do those activities? So we have some principles surrounding those activities. And the principles are described in various ways. So they describe slightly differently uh, to the increased community, but it's essentially the underpinning uh, idea is the same. We're, we're interested in innovative activities, transformative activities, activities that accelerate, so that, that bring that community or the nation forward in a significant way. Activities of national scope and scale, so it's more difficult for us to necessarily see as, as a national capability how an activity that then it's just one institution or uh, one group is useful unless we can see a way of translating that across a, a broader set of users and sustainability which is absolutely critical so that's been one of the challenges of the last few years was a huge upfront capital investment with no following uh, capital placement plan so that sustainability is really critical for what, uh, what we do going forward how do they all linked together, right? If we have activities that fit into one or two or three of those uh, pieces, then they're definitely things we'd be interested in. Ones that fit into four, fantastic. Ones that fit into four and are also sustainable and have an ongoing sustainability around them, even better. Okay, so you can see the sweet spot there. And that's, so this is one of the things we want to test, okay? And this is one of the questions you'll be um, Ask and comment on in the poll is what do you think about this as a framework for trying to describe the activities and describe a way you can approach us for uh, projects or, or work that you want to do in an institution, a cross multiple institution, is kind of international. And the last one is, as I said earlier, in any of those activities, we'll look at how. We can leverage our increased colleagues to deliver on those outputs. Right, a quick reminder about what we do. So, long list of various pieces. The reason I'm putting that one up there is because some of the bits we do are heavy pieces. They're the oil tankers of our current business. Our publication services, so ANS has uh, a lot of services around DOIs and identifiers and Research Data Australia, we have a lot of work around the categories. These are pieces that uh, The collections, the same thing, not quite as old the infrastructure underpinning that, but it's getting towards the end of the end of what's our plan for maintaining and hopefully increasing the value of the collections. And this one, which is not as obvious that it's a big and heavy piece, but we have our skills, policy, uh, engagement, and consultancy activities. The policy activity is actually much more influential than I think people understand. ANS is a very trusted advisor with uh, commentary and input into policy development, uh, and that's a piece which we value very highly. And the skills part, which is a huge program, and we're putting quite a lot of effort into developing that program now under Natasha. Um, and so these are all of the really big heavy bits, um, which we value those functions. So we think that those are things that have legs and we really need to continue to do. Do we need to continue to do them in the same way? Possibly not. We'll find that out through these discussions and um, then part of the consultancy. Yeah. Um, is IRDT Yeah. Yeah. So what we okay. So that's an idea we tossed around. Is the other, so we have data consultants. We have people who do that work now. Really. Um, and is that a, something we should put more effort into developing as a capability? So is there a place for a trusted advisor on policy, on on data strategy, on key research? 
infrastructure strategy. And that's a piece we're looking at, so we're kind of reshaping our engagement group as well to make ourselves more accessible so we can ask those questions. But absolutely, I think we have people with great depth and breadth around policy and duration, licensing, and all of those pieces. And how can we make those even more accessible, but also those materials, how can we make them more accessible to institutions in the public sector? Oh, sorry, the question was. Um, is AIDC uh, looking at making the policy capability uh, more available to institutions? Um, okay, so I guess the last uh, important uh, question is here. Yeah, so we've got that's great. When is that going to happen? We have a pretty tight uh, timeline that we've set for ourselves. We want to have a draft of uh, both uh, our major pieces of the strategy. Um, ready for release by around the Columbia Centre. So don't be released for discussion. We may do another set of these uh, conversations with the state just to check back on how that's going. Um, with the intention that we'll have the, the finished strategy finished as it's now finished for us to continue to go forwards, but an actionable strategy by no later than March. So we should have those program structures, uh, how we're going to define Now, the next part is going to be done by Chief around the whole. Started submitting, that's great. Was everybody able to find the link? You go. Just have You can point your uh, iPhone at it, you can point your uh, um, tablet at it, uh, your Android phone. We are, of course, technology uh, agnostic. That should open up the uh, polling system. There you will see a number of questions. Okay, everybody ready to got it now? Anybody's not got it yet? Yep. Okay. So we have twenty-one votes coming in, twenty-one participants over with half the others. Is he now? So first question, uh, to give us an idea of where you're from, what sort of institutions and universities are present on the representatives of institutions and universities. Okay, the, the next question is around the, the draft activity principles. Um, Ian described those earlier and how they inform our activities and where we're heading. So we're intrigued to hear which of you think is most important for the ARDC to consider in our strategic planning. Yeah, growing, growing sustainability is coming up big, I see. Right, then we'll go back to the poll. We are hard of our sustainability coming out of 21 now. Everybody submitted to that one? I have 39, yes, 39 participants, 39 votes. And moving on to the final question. Which of the ARDC draft strategic themes do you, think should, do you think should be your top priority? If you don't like the fair, I guess you've got to go for skills, but there will be a bit of fair in skills too. Sorry about that. So, sorry, the question was, how are we differentiating between uh, platforms and infrastructure? Ian, do you want to answer that? Uh, so I was going to have to speak to his chest. <laughs> um, so the infrastructure, we're thinking more about the underpinning of resources. So for example, the cloud, uh, storage, uh, identity, uh, some of those pieces. The platforms, I guess, if you look at the data access services, uh, the virtual lab type activities. 
okay, all of that's come in, fair infrastructure is coming out on, a few more vets coming in. Yeah, fair infrastructure seems to be in the lead. Okay, so that was the last of the questions. Thank you all for providing your thoughts. We'll capture those and uh, we'll make sure that we, we have them for our, uh, for our thinking and uh, we use these in the day. And now I'd like to hand back to Ian to be able to take the next step. Just got a message from someone at Wollongong saying, uh, the funny bit is whenever you say, I just want to summarize the critical bits, and then the sound comes out. So I guess not the sound Um All right. Now, the next bit is some um, some questions which will be asking you to consider sort of hoping to have a little kind of breakout part. Um, sadly, the interpretive dance session has been vetoed. Uh, we'll come up, we'll do that a different way. So. We try to boil all of that down. So we've got an idea of what you think the priorities are. Um, you've got a bit of an idea of what we do. And, you know, a lot of you will have some historical knowledge about the things that Anne's Nature and IDS have done. So if we were going to summarize or just really boil down the questions to what should we do more of or start doing? What should we do less of or stop doing? And what should we do differently? So if you could just ponder that for a moment and then add just a little extra bit into it. How do we separate kind of tactical discussion from a strategic discussion? So ARDC has a kind of currently a finite life and we'd like to add as much value as we can during that period. But we're not we don't have the endure, you know, the durability of the institution. Where does the institution want to go in five years, ten years, twenty years? Where do they see these kind of priorities as lying? And maybe that is actually quite different to the transformations we've been talking. So have a little bit of a think about that as well. Um, we now, uh, I think, have some time for discussion. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, Ben's going to run around the microphone. Yeah. Yeah. So my question on in terms of priorities and in terms of conversation is how do you close close the loop in terms of providing feedback for researchers that helps researchers advance their careers and whatnot? So how do how does this impact era? How does this impact the things that researchers and institutions are trying to optimize for so that different people aren't trying to optimize in orthogonal directions? Yeah, so Okay, if I understand the question, what, and that's one of the challenges we have, right? So we care about FAIR. We care about FAIR, not least because the government cares about FAIR. They've invested in data and tools and infrastructure, and they want to see those things get to generate as much value as possible. But you don't get a promotion because you've created a FAIR data set, right? And you don't get, uh, it's difficult to get attribution, and it doesn't, those pieces don't work into an institution's daily life or into a researcher's daily life. So if that's a priority, if that's a piece that people think is important, and we do think it's important, so we're developing a, a sort of strategy around, well, we actually need to communicate this to the funders and say, how can we build this into your workflow, right? And in fact, the funders we've been speaking to are very receptive to that as an idea as well because they too are trying to describe their impact story. They're, they're even earlier in the in the workflow that we are, and, and they, you know, a thousand flowers and stuff happens, and how do they get that back again? So, we, is that a question now, Keith, or is that, yeah, so the, um, we, we're trying to, first, we, first thing we're, we're kind of evangelizing around the thing. Secondly, we're trying to work with the funders to say, well, how can we, and in fact, if you want to get institutions and people to change their behavior, then you go to the people out the country and change their behavior. And um, how do we make sure that those less useful or less used metrics are built into that? So how do we make it that you, know, you have this many T1 pages? For citations, you have this many reference data sets to your name, you have this many international collaborations over material or tools that you produce. So, but that's, that's kind of behind the scenes, gentle moving people in a particular direction. Way. So, that's, that's a lot of fun. Does that answer your question?
things is. Um, a question from the online floor from Jason uh, Andrade. Um, what mechanism and timeline are ARDC looking at for institutional involvement? Noting the timelines they have for their strategy and so on, do you want institutions to walk to directly to ARDC or e research partners? And what is the best way to frame our request for involvement? ARDC being a force multiplier as opposed to a capital investor. All right, good question. Um, and so the answer to that is you can approach us anytime you like. Are we able to provide you with funding for anything? Not at the moment, because we don't have a structure or a process to describe those activities and make sure that everybody gets a fair amount of the whether institutions are purchased through the e-research organisations or through an ENCRIS capability or as a collective or individually, to some extent is up to them. But you've seen the principles that we've described and you've seen the sort of activities and the themes that we're talking about and a collaborative approach is going to be probably the most effective approach. The uh, e-research institutions already act as aggregators for a lot of uh, states. And so it's worthwhile talking to the e-research groups about how, I mean, they've, they've got mileage, they've got experience in how uh, you interact with this particular bit of the world. Uh, so it would be sensible to talk to the e-research organisations. But again, as I said earlier, we have a very broad, uh, we've got an open door to partners. So if there are institutions who have, who want to come and talk to us directly, we're more than happy to talk to them. Okay, so the question was, does ARDC have a position with regard to sensitive data, I guess? Um, no, we don't have a policy on the sensitive data. We recognise that that's a challenge and it's a very current uh, question about how can researchers collaborate and use sensitive data. And our position is we would like to facilitate that activity. So if we can de-risk some of that activity through uh, resourcing or bringing different partners together and we're very interested in doing that. Again, we're, not try we're trying not to drive a research agenda or a kind of infrastructure agenda except in as much as it responds to bigger national kind of priorities. So we do have, we are talking with various people about approaches to sensitive data and various other kind of platforms and other things as well. So no, we don't have a specific policy on sensitive data. As I said earlier, the original increase in investment was largely a capital investment, and that was very long. Right? There was a lot of money up front with no real capital support after that. So, and the world is a little bit different now to what it was 10 or 15 years ago. So, we're looking at all sorts of different models for doing that. So, that's one bit how do we smooth out the lumps and prevent this kind of funding eclipse? Uh, and that's exactly so. Back to Wilkinson, there is, is working on. How do we approach that question? Right? In the context that we're at the point here for some of these infrastructure pieces, how are we going to make sure we don't lose some of the capital? How do we broaden um, the pool of people who can exploit those pieces? Work slightly into that question, right? Because even if we did do an upfront capital investment on our pieces, we can create a structure in an agent which says actually that needs to be very accessible to the maximum number of people and that would be one of the conditions of that infrastructure investment. So there are all sorts of different ways you can do that. Um, as I said, we've got various people doing various bits of work and some of those threads will come together towards the end of this year and I think that would be a useful time for people to look at that and say, look, you haven't, you, you've forgotten this bit about how there's a university somewhere that missed out on being 
a club last time get a useful allocation or a useful engagement with that resource that's going it's over. It's over. Oh, it's over. It's me, Ian. Um, following up with Steve Cassidy's question there, <clears throat> yeah, well, I guess my views on the lack of sustainability of the last, uh, where we are now, uh, are quite well known to everyone in the room. Um, I, I think we don't need to look for much further proof than uh, Ursa announcing its closing yesterday. Uh, and uh, the Pause having dropped out of Nectar and you know, NCI having co opted most of its equipment for a contingent system as opposed to the National Cloud. To say that the, the, the current infrastructure of business model is broken, um, <clears throat> perhaps except for those like in Melbourne and Monash's case that make the most, of, most uh, out of the, uh, the leverage. So, my question is sorry, that's a comment. My question is uh, um, to what extent uh, I, I don't hear anything about business model price or um, most importantly the idea of incubation or seed funding for sustainability as opposed to subsidy or uh, handout funding um, I think handout funding hasn't worked so, so uh, at least it hasn't worked it's not evenly distributed across the country and so uh, is there a, a <coughs> is there a a move or a change in thinking to the idea of, of seed funding so some of these uh, initiatives as opposed to here's some capital with strings uh, attached uh, in order to produce a sustainable business model that lives beyond the life of the project. Yep, okay, good question, absolutely. I agree that the, the existing business model has challenges and different challenges for different organisations and institutions. Um, we are taking a completely blank piece of paper around how we do the next set of investments. So you can see at one end of that spectrum might be the same as last month, my machines would be more off you go. We'll generate exactly the same challenges that we have now. The other end of that is not buying a single machine for anybody, right? You have to come up with a business model around the machine and we will do what we can to, to push a sustainability model through that. So with the question of the business model, we love that into the sustainability category, right? So all of those proposals we're looking at have to have some idea of how they can survive without us here, right? And from our perspective, we will be looking at things, getting into things with a view of how can we get out again without breaking. Okay, so that's a little bit on the business on the side. In terms of incubators, we have that innovation priority and the transformation priority, and absolutely that fits in there. Right, so different organisations <coughs> collaborate with open you know, may not be on there, maybe research teams using something. You know, we're, we're, up, for, we're up for anything. If, if a community says, well, in fact, the best model for us is to subscribe to XYZ service, let's run out of the US, then we're going to be interesting. And what's your sustainability model around that? That's the best thing you can do. So we'll go, we really have a very open view on that. And I think, you know, yes, we very clear over time about the challenges around these business models. And I think part of that is because the people we deal with are not exactly the same. Some are very deeply subsidised by their institutions, some are less so. There are different business models in all of those pieces. How do we make sure that the bits we invest in don't go pop when other stuff changes around it? So Max is the guy to talk to around the hardware side. But we consider the platforms to be infrastructure, and we consider the data to be infrastructure as well. So how do we create not a necessarily a business model per se, but a sustainability model around those? Some of those it may be actually these are national class assets. We need a different. We need to approach the government with a different model for some of those pieces. So like I said, the functionality is the bit that we think is really important. So if, if the functionality requirement that comes out of this is X thousand pools of cloud of some description, you know, there's a whole different range of ways you can supply that and we'll go through a process to that. If it is this data set is solid gold, right? This is a piece that Australia needs to be competitive, then perhaps that's different too. This is a data set which is beautifully curated and it's fair, but we haven't got a demonstrated kind of impact story around it just yet. How do we generate that so that we can bring that up as well? So it's sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're just just one at the back first, and we can come back to So where institutions or institutes had common goals, do you have approaches or processes in place to facilitate these collaborative, say, national projects? So whether it be something like your sensitive data frameworks or big data um, infrastructure, uh, in that kind of sense, is there any process at the moment to bring these groups together to enable this? Unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't have the process yet. And in fact, if uh, institutions and groups that are getting together want to come and suggest ways that we can do that in an effective way, that would be really helpful. Always remember that resourcing spent on X is resourcing you can't spend on Y. So there is just the balance. And one of the challenges with ARDC is we're kind of general capability, astronomy focused, or bio, or eco, or whatever it is. And so all those things need to balance together. We're working on that process, which will be guided by what comes out of these engagements. So for example, if, if there is a very strong state-based, you know, step one towards national seamless data world is a state-based data seamless world, then that's something we want to talk about and investigate. But in the context of that's great, we might do it within a state to begin with, but how can we make sure all the other states know that that's happening and have visibility of it and be involved in it where it's So unfortunately we don't have those processes just yet. I was going to ask um, again around the sensitive data. We've been having a, I think a relatively good time of it in New South Wales because there's a um, direction between the health and, and the university sector. Um, do you see opportunities for ARDC to be doing more to facilitate similar sorts of activities in other states? Absolutely, yes. So I think we're very interested in, so that those kind of transformative exercises that are a bunch of people with a shared interest, quite often they're exactly the same sets of shared interests that other people have too. So the community development part we're very keen on, being involved or having visibility into the actual, you, know, you may have some technical or some policy models that work very well, we're very interested in how we can translate those into a national environment. Anything else? Good. <laughs> All right, well, I think we're almost um, bang on time. Oh, yeah. Are we good? Um, all right, so the next... Um, the session was going to be around um, breaking groups up to, to, uh, into groups to talk about uh, what I've spoken about, some of the questions we've had, and these were really, rather than leaving people in a vacuum, this was to give people some talking points. We don't want this to be just what you talk about. What we want is to not have people sitting there quietly not talking about anything we can have more important or more useful, more relevant to talk about within the groups that would be really helpful. Um, I'm not really sure what the arrangements are for splitting up people. Michelle. Someone rescue me, someone should work. Uh, the next half hour, we'd like uh, lots of input back from you. Uh, so we'd like to split you into groups of six to ten people, which is probably five or six groups. There'll be a note taker of an ARDC staff member with each group to uh, record what you're all talking about. Uh, and um, then from 11.30 to 12, we'll have a report back uh, from each of those groups and a summary of what we've come up with. Now, there's three core questions that we want you to think about. What we should do more of or start doing, as in what should the ARDC do more of, uh, what the ARDC should do less of or stop doing, uh, and what we should do differently. So in terms of splitting up into groups, we had thought about doing it uh, using the results of the survey by institutions, e research infrastructure providers, etc. But given that most of you are institutions, uh, I suggest we abandon that and simply go for random groupings, does that make sense? Or if you feel there's some like-minded souls uh, from other interest capabilities or government or whatever that you want to form your own group with, that's also an option. 
Otherwise, uh, if we could have one group of six to ten people in the back over there, one in the back over there, one down the front here, one down the front here, maybe uh, one uh, towards the middle there, and we'll see how that looks in terms of numbers. Dear all, um, I hope you, uh, you're still on the line. Um, um, apologies for the, the audio there. Uh, what I'll do now is I'll lead a discussion on the three questions that were, were raised in the, the end of the plenary. Michelle just very briefly mentioned that there's going to be discussion on, on three questions, and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts. And what I'll then do at the end of this, uh, this break, this virtual breakout, is feed those, uh, your responses back into the, the plenary thoughts. So um, um, the first question was around what should the ARDC do more of or what sort of things should the ARDC do as new activities or new things. So um, please throw into the mix um, any thoughts what we should do more of or new activities. Ah, we go. So here, coming in through the chat from Mike, I would like to see infrastructure made more accessible in terms of cost to smaller institutes. Okay. Does anybody any, agree on that? Um, different other perspectives on that? For example, to get the good version out, a good version of AAF. SOS is 28k a year. SSO, oh, single sign on. Okay, yes. And a further comment here is uh, yes, we need to be able to get easier access to HPC or cloud computing. And a follow up comment from Mike Baker on his earlier comment about. Uh, accessibility in terms of cost to smaller institutes is uh, I then get asked if the money could go to a research assistant instead. Um, further suggestion, I would like to see a focus on interoperability, i.e. one point of access regardless of source coupled with one point of discoverability. Okay, well, then I have a question back to CAC, so is that CA Carlson? Um, when you say a focus on interoperability, one point of access, are you talking about access to data or tools or platforms, um, infrastructure? Any thoughts there? Ah, research outputs, okay. One point of access to research outputs regardless of source. And research outputs of every description. I'm guessing that means not just data, but a whole range of research outputs. Okay. Okay, and one further point from C.H. Carlson. Access to tools to support research outputs would also be a fantastic asset, or group, groups of assets. Any other thoughts on what we should do more of or new activities we should focus on? Okay, in that case, I'll move on to the next question. And the next question is what should the ARDC do less of? What should we end? Or should we just keep on doing everything we're doing? <laughs> okay, that's nice one from Jason. <laughs> Can't you just do more while not doing less of anything, you know, because of the infinite funding? <laughs> yes, very good point, Jason. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course, it would be wonderful to do just more of everything. Uh, I think the other question indeed is uh, if we do new stuff, that usually means we'd have to make choices about dropping off other stuff. So. Okay, so in all seriousness, as is Jason, uh, again, building on that previous point about uh, uh, not, doing, <laughs> not doing less of anything, um, in all seriousness, ARDC has previously tried to make capital investments in infrastructure, and perhaps it could do less of direct capital and more force multiplier in a way that ties into sustainability. 
Okay, Jason, do you want to elaborate a little bit on how you see if you have got an example of that force multiplier uh, tying into sustainability? Because as you've noticed, sustainability is a point that comes up we see as one of the one of the principles in our activities. So Jason writes, this is to position for how we can look at using the commercial cloud options. So Jason, can you explain a little bit more how you see that? juxtaposition of cloud, commercial cloud versus the role that the ARDC could play in that space. Okay, so this is the position for how we can look at, yeah, sorry, the, the things that ARDC does, well, uh, does really well is bringing people together and using things. The things that ARDC has done less well is translating its original capital investments into models that ended up being sustainable. So Jason, as I'm reading that, do you mean that um, you suggest that we bring users together around using commercial cloud rather than um, providing solutions that might not be sustainable down the track? Is that sort of the angle you're, you're, you're suggesting there? <laughs> Jason, you can unmute and just talk. <laughs> Oh, I didn't realize we were actually allowed to talk. I thought we had to type everything. <laughs> and so I'm frantically trying to type really fast, but I can't keep up with uh, how fast you're reading. Um, so, so I guess my thought process was, um, in the past, we've relied on ARDC and through the e-research partners with some of its capital investments for the stuff that we want to do. And where ARDC succeeded is bringing us together to do something, but it hasn't worked so well where it's been the sole funding source because then we've ended up in this situation that um, if ARDC funding goes away, the service falls over and that ties in not just the infrastructure, but the people to look after it. So I guess I'm trying to point out the commercial cloud is one thing that I see we will be using a lot more of over the next five or 10 years. And I'm trying to figure out how ARDC can help us get there without being the funding model for going, you know, you put a chunk of money in and once we've used it all up, that's the end of the service. That that model clearly won't work. So if you look at the institutions that are participating in projects in ARDC, and there's a, a whole bunch of different universities I'm thinking of here, um, many of them have cloud strategies and processes to use the cloud. And the research part is the part that is the most difficult for those institutions to sometimes get a grip around. And I'm trying to think of where ARDC could actually help and the money for helping that cloud space would probably have to come out from the bit where you're currently funding actual infrastructure um, purchases in um, data storage in compute cycles uh, that, that's my suggestion it's a difficult mm -hmm. one because obviously it's it's had significant value in the past to people but um, I don't see how it can be sustainable in the future if ARDC were not to be around in five years Okay, and uh, so okay, if we're not um, if we're not funding we're not funding commercial cloud cycles, maybe um, where do you see the value that ARDC can bring around using commercial cloud? Um, well, 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 for research, ARDC maybe has the ability, and perhaps with some of the institutions and new research partners of sitting down across all of those commercial clouds, coming up with a, a deal that helps suit us for research and maybe some of the contractual capabilities or some of the scale issues. I mean, I tend to think of AIDC as sort of the, in some ways, the research equivalent of Cordit. Cordit looks after a lot of the enterprise parts of what institutions are trying to do in terms of, you know, learning and teaching. But Cordit doesn't necessarily have the uh, depth on the research side. And AIDC does have the depth in the context of the people that it's got from ANS and RDS and Nectar and understanding the research problems. So there's a role that they could perhaps play in helping us move faster into that space. That was my thought process originally. Yep. Thanks. Okay, so uh, are anybody, uh, any others, any thoughts around that space, if that makes sense? Uh, do, do people agree with Jason or do people have other thoughts that say, uh, no, that doesn't ring a bell for us? I, I, I was going to say, because there's no comment on my position, I do like Mike's uh, suggestion, but the only thing I think is that isn't the outreach part of your ARDC normal model and were you asking us about what to do less or what to do more of at the moment? 
Um, we are now, we, we were at the question of where we, uh, we, we came to the question, what should we do less of? Um, uh, this is a, in, indeed one of the questions about doing more of or doing differently. So Mike's comment there about doing uh, more outreach would be useful, getting researchers who are not on the leading edge to make use of ARDC services. So our question back to Mike, um, when you say outreach, do you mean outreach to researchers individually or do you mean outreach to organisations so that the organisations can then internally take that to their researchers? And while Mike is typing, or possibly Sorry, thinking, I'm, I've, I've decided to unmute myself as well. Geez. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, for example, I I can see um, a number of research groups um, you know, within my own institution who I think would benefit from the types of services um, that you have, but um, I'm not well placed to. Uh, hold their hand and get them on um, I, I can sort of make those initial connections perhaps between them and the, the people running the services but then I need the people running the services to have um, the time to help them get set up because I'm often seeing people who may have never used high performance computing or may, may have never used um, a, a virtual laboratory um, and my experience has been I, I don't want to I don't want to um, label everybody in the same way, but but there are many people who really need who perhaps don't have the confidence and they need they really need that help to get them to make those first steps. Okay, and the reason I'm asking that is because if ARDC provides services direct to researchers especially if there's questions, uh, if there's models around that, around costing, for example, uh, that's something I guess we'd have to have a, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd want to engage with the institution and the organization around that to make sure that, uh, uh, that the pricing and the costing makes sense and that the organization is okay with that and with that model. Jason, you could read that one out, actually. That's, uh, yeah. Mike, I was just thinking about what you were saying, and, and I guess I wanted to specifically single out that Tom Honeyman, as part of um, ARDC and, and ANS previously, uh, does a significant work in outreach and we've had conversations where he's more than happy to come out to an institution to coordinate or facilitate discussion around ARDC. So I guess I'm trying to work out is did you simply need to know about him what he can do or did you did we just need more Tony, Tom Honeyman's on the ground is what you were looking for to come and help have those conversations around ARDC services? It, it sounds to me that maybe um, I, I, I haven't been in contact with the right people and I need to know who the right people to get into contact with are. Um, if, if there are, if there are um, Tom Honeyman's um, around in the uh, available to us. Sorry, I don't know where you are, Mike. So I, I oh, um, you're in New South Wales, Sydney, but. Sydney um, yeah. Children's Medical Research Institute. Sure. So, so Tom's definitely the guy to, yeah. to talk to, and we can take this offline, and I'll get him to talk to you. Yes, but Mike, Mike, yeah, Mike, Mike, I can, get, <laughs> I can, I can indeed get you to uh, get, well, introduce you to Tom, Tom Honeyman, and he can help you out. I think a larger question there is uh, indeed how many Toms have we got, uh, and how much bandwidth does Tom have in total? And uh, is this something that we'd actually need more more of? Because that would then, um, sounds like something would definitely, sounds like there's an interest in continuing that and continuing the out, that outreach offering. Um, but there's a question, should we expand it? And should there be more of it? Uh, should we have more time available for that? So that's a question to all of you. And I'd be intrigued in your thoughts. So Keith, unless someone else wants to talk, I was going to say outreach is definitely helpful, but it should sort of be a time or scope limited activity. And the reason I say that was because I'm thinking of ARDC services that outreach reaches into and training is one of the big ones, right? So a lot of the work that Ian talked about around doing FAIR will be delivered through um, training courses or applications and services that need to have FAIR input and so on. So the outreach will help to a certain extent, but there comes a point in time where you go, 
100% of outreach effort only gets 1% more um, effect. And so I, I would have said you might want to, ARDC might want to schedule for 12 months of intensive outreach, but taper off after that and more concentrate on the services. That would be the feedback I'd provide. And I think a balance there is that um, you need to have outreach about something. So you need to have service underlying that. So purely focusing on outreach with no content behind that, no, no services to offer. Is a yeah, thing. So that, that's, that's a given. We're expecting you're going to have useful services that researchers actually want to know about. Otherwise, they'll go, this is a waste of time and I'm going to ignore ARDC. So I don't, I don't think we're questioning that you won't have useful services, but I just thinking about the timeline and the mechanism, once you've reached critical mass, I don't know how much more outreach effort you could put in because by definition, you do want to get to some sort of critical point, both at a national level, but also down at that institutional level. We should be telling each other as well. I don't think outreach is just ARDC's um, you know, problem. We, we should be communicating um, collaboratively too. So coming back to um, uh, um, Mike's question earlier on about making an infrastructure more accessible for smaller institutions. Uh, you, so you mentioned AAF and um, getting, getting access to AAF for single sign-on. Um, access to HPC, other, other bits of infrastructure, other bits, other angles there where you see that at present it's hard to get access to the, the infrastructure or the services? Mike, is that something you're going to elaborate on or Keith, are you looking for other people to provide feedback on Mike's point? Um, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more from Mike, but I'd also be interested to hear from others if they agree, if they have the same perspective as Mike, uh, uh, if they have other other services uh, or pieces of infrastructure that they would also like access to? So Mike, over to you. Uh, uh, that would be unmuting perhaps? Yeah, um, so look, I was just using that as a specific example because it was just something that, that I was coming across last week um, where I think AAF has tremendous benefits and I want my researchers to make good use of things like cloud store etc um, but we, we have a sort of chicken and egg situation in that we're, um, we're a small small organization we're trying to follow best practice we um, with all of our commercial offerings we go single sign on and it's usually a no cost option um, because it makes the you know means we can follow best practice and security and it also reduces the administrative burden um, on, an, on a small IT uh, group um, but in order to do that um, with the AAF there is what is probably a trivial amount of money for a university but is uh, it is one that gets picked up on um, in a smaller uh, organization and asked you know could that money be spent somewhere else um, so it's you know it's things like that. I think the, things like the AAF are the gateway for, to a lot of services for our researchers, um, and I would imagine it was a fairly small amount of infrastructure uh, money from ARDC's point of view um, to just you know make that available to everybody um, at, a, at a low or, or no cost option. And Mike, how do you see that in relative to the sustainability discussion? Because we could, we could in theory fund fund for you to be be a member for a for a year. Uh, and how would that be sustainable down the track? Well, yeah, next next year I'll be asked that same question again. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's just a. I think it's a question. Having worked at a large university, and I know that the cost of those things isn't even on the radar. Um, and, and then working at a smaller um, organisation, it, it, it is more significant. Now, um, what I could do is um, 
talk to the other members of Amory um, and see whether... Listen to me, somebody. Boy. That's okay, I, I think I think the, the session you. is now wrapped up. Um, sorry, I, um, I will go back into the makers, um Come up to the front, please. Yeah. So if the note note people could come up um, one at a time and summarise where they got to in their conversations, and we might have um, just adding the extra bits from each conversation. We'll be bringing all of these uh, comments together as well, and then joining them up with the other state conversations too. Wow, it should start people talking, they won't shut up. Okay, shush. <laughs> okay, uh, we had a really good discussion. <laughs> Although it maybe should have, should have been over gin or something like that, but anyway, there was a, a bit coming out there. From, uh, so in terms of what the ARDC should do more of, um, and uh, it was actually very difficult to capture the richness of everything that we talked about, but uh, in dot points, uh, greater support for skills and training, especially in the carpentries, um, being a source of peer review and feedback for data and software so that it can count as an ERA output, uh, engaging with professional associations to serve as a spokes organisation or to work with others to provide a leadership group that promotes software as a legitimate research output in one that counts, for ERA. Um, do more of the virtual lab program, which was described as a jewel in the crown, um, but was also noted that it's only of use to particular disciplines as well, and that, that is of course an issue. Um, should do more partnerships with institutions for joint infrastructure investments, and um, spread the ARDC nerve around. Don't make decisions based on the host institution of the ARDC. Sorry, that was open at the time. <laughs> That's right, I noted down who said that. Yep. <laughs> um, inform researchers and partner with universities to encourage uptake of cloud store as opposed to uh, one uh, use of OneDrive and Dropbox that are currently used. So that was the summary of what ARDC could do more of. Um, actually, no one said we should do less of anything, so that, that's pretty good. So we just add that to our to-do list. Um, what should we do differently? Uh, there were two points there. Uh, make clear uh, the way in which uh, institutions can make a pitch to the ARDC for funding. How does that happen? Um, and also improve communications um, as well as the availability for the NECTA VLs. So there's a bit of a feeling that um, different institutions didn't actually know what, what was available to them in the NECTA VLs and how researchers can use it. So that, that's a communication issue that we could improve. That's it from my group. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that group. Max, did you want to come up? I'll say uh, old school. Um, pen and paper, long lived written work, uh, also allows you to shred it if things go wrong. Um, we started off talking a little bit about data because we thought that the group that we were talking with uh, were um, interested in the way that data moved about the place. Uh, this then transformed into a stream of consciousness. I'm looking for the, looking forward to the afternoon session. I don't think we're going to be short of uh, topics to talk about, so that's great. Uh, a lot talked about integration and the way that data and uh, services, particularly analytical services, needed to join together a little bit more. Uh, actually, no, that was a lot more. Uh, so we're talking integration and um, the way that uh, the virtual labs had at least started that off. Uh, this moved into a very quick discussion about the nature of EU research within an institution and how it is generally separate from the ICT provision of those institutions. And that can sometimes be a barrier talk of uh, uh, national capability which is not met or falls flat at the border of an uh, institution. Uh, many examples of that seem to, to come forward. Um, that reinforced the idea that this was an academic undertaking or at least a grown up academic undertaking rather than ICT undertaking and that's quite an important thing to consider when talking to institutions and there seems to be a role there for the ARDC to act as a broker between institutions uh, at least with the idea of attending and communicating with that with the national infrastructures and the government investments in those infrastructures that were available to them. And then it was incumbent on the people who were using those infrastructures to then communicate that to their institutions. This uh, saw an interesting 
uh, behavior of the movement of these sorts of institutional discussions moving from DDR to CIOs. So that has a, um, a lot of challenges. Uh, do correct me any of my team if you think I've gone wildly off pace. Uh, so we saw a big uh, concern about the value proposition of the market that ARTC is supporting, and we needed to understand that part a little bit more. Uh, that led to advocacy, that led to the uh, value propositions, services and infrastructures that were not only valid and valuable, but also valued by the people who use them. Did I miss anything out from that? Okay, so uh, we some of the same themes are coming up uh, for uh, most of the groups, it seems. But uh, I think the group uh, really started, or actually a theme that ran throughout our discussion was uh, a transparency of processes, uh, especially around uh, project ideas that bear on uh, potential communities of practice. And uh, somewhat awkwardly for me, uh, around their engagement uh, as well, uh, that we basically expose what's going on now and foster uh, collaboration. That uh, uh, we had both that uh, we wanted more sustainable planning for infrastructure spending in particular, uh, but also to allow for seed funding, smaller ideas that that we needed to balance essentially uh, uh, sustainable practice and taking risks as well. Um, the, um, the topic of acceleration came up in our discussion uh, that that was important for some other partners that we needed to basically provide fast access to resources and infrastructure um, uh, and more frameworks uh, or more readily available frameworks uh, so like most of those frameworks for those partners um, the suggestion came that we needed to have the possibility of more centralized services in data publishing uh, that are uh, sustainable. Uh, uh, we also talked about the uh, uh, possibility of having uh, uh, different rules across different uh, program streams, or recognizing the real difference between smaller projects uh, and uh, the local risk associated with those through to larger collaborative projects. Uh, I think that just was Did I miss anything? I sure did. Yes, more. services um, based on best intentions and lots of funding if the hearts and minds of our leaders being published in the biggest journals and that's what the idea is. So I think there's a real opportunity for the next one that's quite seriously we're going to get the services that um, have great ideas but Thank you. And interestingly, we had a workshop just on touch on one of the things you spoke about there about big projects versus little projects and how you can make the little ones you can make it as, as easy as possible to make them take off and fail or succeed as quickly as possible, whereas the big ones maybe you need more care around them and things move around. It's kind of fast fail and fast follow model, so that's something we're trying to do as well. Okay, so um, our group were really, really nice, actually. Um, so in, in terms of talking about um, what ARDC should do more of, um, we started off um, with thinking about um, some, of, some of the concerns about that impact model and um, recognising or thinking, at least at this outline level, that it looks quite linear. And our discussion um, really wanted to concentrate on the importance of uh, feedback loops and um, evaluation along the way to actually get to that um, that level of impact that is desired. So we were quite, um, there was a lot of interest in um, certainly picking up from what Mork was saying about being able to get through to that faculty level um, about how um, the, 
the importance and the impact of funding um, funding research infrastructure. Um, and that needs to actually be recognised as something as important as the research itself. Uh, and how do we get that message through to people, um, to our researchers and to people at dean and senior administrative level. Um, so then we, and we talked about also, even getting the um, talking about impact of research infrastructure itself. So I've got a little bit meta um, for me there. Um, that's cool. Um, when we when we were talking about what ARDC should do less of, um, there were some some feelings about um, how about that long funding model. I think that's a that's a nice way of looking at um, uh, how. Um, some of distribution of funding being a little hit and miss, um, but the concentration of the discussion was really more about how do you look at funding across a wide variety of different types of service, and then what that looks like from an institutional perspective, and how we deal with the differences with those different capabilities that uh, ARDC um, is responsible for. In terms of what things ARDC could be doing differently. Um, there were, we talked a bit about, um, from the administration side of institutions, um, we were a fairly sort of public service type group, um, or that was our representation of our institutions in our discussion. Um, and we were looking for ways that we might be able to smooth some of those institutional processes so that, um, so that things like ethics committees um, may have better standard processes so researchers can get on with doing their research being on the right platform so being able to push that message about what are the right platforms or what is what is the worthwhile kind of infrastructure and going back to that hearts and minds thing um, have we gotten through to people about what are the important things to be um, yeah uh, and we did um, we did recognize that our institutions are quite slowly moving beasts at some time so maybe it would be better in terms of prioritising to perhaps pare back a little on, um, on the innovation side and move more towards things that are um, more easily scalable um, with of course some other sort of um, magical props for um, those high risk interesting things that actually could actually be so a bit of everything. So this is the feedback from the uh, online uh, participants through Zoom. Um, so a number of suggestions. Uh, first of all, to look at uh, in, regarding the question, what could the ARDC more of? Uh, uh, infrastructure and services and mm -hmm. making them more accessible to small organisations. That raised some questions about sustainability. Uh, we, would AIC, ARDC fund uh, the services and infrastructure? But that might be a bit challenging. But on the other hand, there is an opportunity there for ARDC to act as a broker and to bring together needs and to uh, organise that. Um, another slightly related thought was um, uh, bringing together the needs around commercial cloud. So trying to explore more what what could commercial cloud or commercial cloud offerings uh, be and look like, and where could the ARDC play a role in be to get those needs? Um, interesting parallel where there is with Audit and the way Audit operates and uh, brings together uh, needs. Uh, Audit does that more operational IT level, and uh, ARDC that more around research needs. Um, another suggestion around doing some new, new things. Uh, providing one point of access and discoverability for all research outputs. And finally, um, another point, doing more of or the same, We're continuing work in that space, outreach, making sure that there's outreach available to help researchers use all sorts of services and infrastructure, including HPC, virtual labs, things like that. And balancing that with institutions, working together with institutions in that space, so making sure that researchers within those institutions have access to all those services and understand how they work. And there again, there's a balancing act between how much services do you provide and how much outreach do you provide on top of that. Uh, the question, should ARDC do less of anything? Uh, 
so that was lovely, uh, I suppose, one way. Uh, so there's the balancing act about how do we do new things uh, and combine that with the not, not stopping the activities we do. Thanks. Thank you. Adrian. Our group was really, really mean. Well, just as me. Uh, no, it was a very engaged group. They uh, really focused in on a couple of key things that they were looking to the ARDC for was capacity. There were some things that the institutions felt they didn't have capacity for. And some things where they had a capacity, but they really wanted ARDC to build something a bit more coherent than the current system. Some coordination, uh, collaboration, uh, exchanging of approaches, uh, sharing of approaches uh, amongst the institutions. Um, so there were the sort of two broad themes. Uh, there was a few examples of those. Uh, for example, the, the virtual labs, the, there was a, a suggestion that we really make those very nationally uh, and all sorts of platforms that exist in institutions and some of the more well-resourced institutions could be made into uh, more accessible national platforms. Um, the Galaxy Genomics was seen as an opportunity in that area to really have um, something that's very accessible for researchers at every institution. Um, it was a desire to not set up stuff locally differently uh, and that if there was ways that the IRDC could help in provisioning of resources in data and uh, analysis that you could point to or reuse or auto build or you know, stuff that would make that would make a difference to the institution if they could tap into that. We were asked the very provocative question uh, is the ARDC just going to make the rich richer and the poor poorer? Meaning, you know, <laughs> well, she didn't exactly say it. In <laughs> uh, but worse, you know, was it going to be the end result of this? Was it just going to be that the GRA more resources and less money versus less? The answer was obviously no. Uh, that it, as a national infrastructure, part one of the uh, outcomes was that there was greater access across the board for everyone, including the well resourced institutions. But it was really a, a question of you know, where, how were we going to uh, be able to deliver outcomes for the smaller universities as well as uh, some of the others. Uh, the security of medical, so medical data came up and that was one where, we, where I think the, what I heard was that the universities were saying we don't have capacity to deal with this sensitive data and so if we could all work together on this. A, a solution there that would be a really good thing. Uh, linkages to instruments and big instruments, there's a more coherent way of doing that across the, uh, the sector. We kept on coming back to this desire for a similar framework. So, if we're doing cloud implementation, data implementation, what's a, what is, is there a framework that the ARDC can provide and uh, can give back to the institutions to? Either implement themselves or plug into some kind of national framework that they are more coherent way of doing that. It's for everything, so persistent identifiers for people and grants and instruments and people, and the ARBC bringing that information together across the institutions in a, in a very coherent way is what was asked for. Um, and then finally, that we build a wall that people can come throw tomatoes and plates and break things and all the things that they don't like they can just chuck it at us and then we would uh, bring it all together and make it into a nice tomato or uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I think less facetiously uh, a way where things are very difficult uh, and they uh, seem to find a way of uh, brokering a solution bringing things together or creating something more creative. Last Thanks, Ian. We, of course, talk about sensitive data as well, uh, but not just storage, also analysis and safe haven environments are on the, on the roadmap. Um, 
better access for non-university staff to, to that data. So I have identities for medical staff, networks for, for medical institutions, services and platforms, so translation from them. Um, and maybe the role of the AI to see is to help them facilitate those discussions that are already happening. So that's we read earlier, this is a discussion happening here. Can we make that happen elsewhere? Uh, and the idea was that ARDC could be the sense of data sprinkling, so you can neutral ground for, for having, helping those, um, those conversations. Um, so education came up there as well. Uh, making the existing national questions more fair. Someone in our group pointed out the equal connection can't we search for them, so they can be more fair. Um, and including archiving principles alongside the fair principles, so preservation and disposal. And how do you how do you do that? Because this data has to often sustain for a long time. How do you have this ANC get in there? On the back of that, we talked a bit about the exponential growth in data making it very difficult. So having letting people have mature discussions about disposing of data, not just keeping it. Uh, focusing on live data, not just published data, uh, having more sustainability discussions. Uh, including expiry dates on resources and projects, wrapping lifecycle management around them. Um, and if we're going to talk about sustainability, we need to talk about value, talk about value in a way of measuring value, so what services could AADC provide to help measure value? That's the citation stuff. Um, and if you are going to wrap a project up, having the ability to export dump data out. What should you do less of? Uh, Someone suggested to have less unfocused consultation. Uh, you know, other web, general webinars that is for or should be made more specific problems like sensitive data problems. Um, and this is really do more of like less of, but have better coordination with others. So, for example, there are other training providers, well, there's a good training provider here in, in New South Wales Intersect, um, have to make sure the ANC works with them and approaches partners together. What should you do differently? Uh, funding must be clear on how things are sustained, um, or how they will be shut down if it's innovation funding. Be less prescriptive about focus, maybe focus on impacts rather than um, how, how things happen, so more incubation, less handouts and seeding, and better national coordination over the fact that there's an example that came up there was there was this no, uh, the RDS infrastructure and there's no national view of that, so how can we do that? And they're all pretty useful and valuable ideas which we'll build into the into the documents as we go forward. Um, I think I've been in quite significantly to lunchtime. No, we're still good. Um, if you are able to stay after lunch, we have uh, we're going to do a similar exercise to this, but focused on particular activities. Um, and so they'll go into various rooms and go through a similar conversation and report back again at the end. As I said, we're going to do this through all of the different states, and then we'll aggregate all of that uh, into some form of document which will feed into our strategy document as well. Um, but now, much time. All right. Oh, okay. Hang on. I need to tell people which route. Now, just before you all disappear, um, for those people that want to stay on the satellite meetings, I just want to tell you which rooms they're in. Um, so you can go there. The infrastructure group will, will remain in this room. The skills uh, group will be on the uh, uh, tutorial room just across that direction, uh, in room number four on this floor. Uh, the platforms discussion will be a floor above us. So if you take the wooden staircase up, uh, and look for room number nine or 04.009. And if you want to join the fair and trusted collections discussion, that will be on the fifth floor. So two floors up in room six, and you'll have to take the lift to get there. Fantastic. Right. Thank you very much. Nice time. Go on.